Hello, everyone. This is Erica Podest, and welcome back to the fourth and final part of our forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data webinar series. Today, our uh, training will be focused on forest height estimation, and we have a special guest lecturer, Professor Paul Cicada from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Professor Cicada used to be at JPL before moving to academia, and we've known each other for a, a long time, and it's really a, a, a great pleasure to have him as a guest lecturer today. Uh, Professor Cicada also is an active member of the NISAR science team, and he represents the ecosystems group. So he will be talking to you about uh, the focus of NISAR on ecosystems and how the NISAR data is going to be used for different INSAR uh, applications such as forest stand height estimation. So we are in the last part of our, um, our series, and I think you've gotten a great overview on the looking at a time series analysis of forest change, doing land cover classification using radar and optical data, mangrove mapping, and now this is a new perspective here on the use of INSAR for forest stand height estimation. Remember, the homework will be announced at the end of this session, as, as, long, as well as the due date, sure that you complete the homework and uh, have attended all the live sessions in order to get that certificate of completion at the end. So I will pass it on to Professor Cicada. Welcome, and uh, you can take it from here. Okay, and thank you so much, Erica, uh, and welcome everybody uh, to this uh, fourth part of, of, of the series that's being presented here. So uh, I just want to give a little something about background. Uh, so we're talking about forest stand height here. And so you guys have already gone through three parts of this uh, series, and those have had sort of varying levels of complexity. So you've done time series analysis of basic change, you've done land cover classification with radar and optical data, and you've worked some with the mangrove mapping using the double bounce signature. So these algorithms have varying degrees of complexity. Some are very simple classifications. Others are time series and involve different degrees of machine learning, things like the random forest or decision trees. Some use polarimetry. Others use things like multi-frequency and concepts of data fusion. So uh, by comparison, this four stand height, or we abbreviate with FSH, is sort of a never another level of complexity. And so it requires a fair amount of background knowledge uh, and, and uh, to sort of successfully make use of this, this approach. And some of those aspects are, are related to SAR processing, interferometric SAR, and also being good at uh, making data inquiries at the NASA uh, DAG. And so um, today is meant to be an introduction to that overall process. And um, although the material might be challenging, uh, for those of you who are looking for ways forward and you know, new uh, techno technology fields to delve into, um, you probably have heard of interferometry at the very least, and so this might be a good foot in the door, um, uh, despite the complexities of, of bringing yourself up to speed in, in this domain. So uh, just a little bit something about myself. So um, I, yes, uh, uh, Erica is correct. I, I worked at the NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, until uh, 2005. And since then I've been at the remote, micro remote sensing laboratory uh, at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And we have a 40 year history of working on microwave sensor development. We work with uh, different organizations like NASA, NP, NOAA, DARPA, JAXA, ISRO, et cetera. And there on the right, you see uh, some of the different types of things that we do. I mean, we're an engineering department, so we, we build circuits, we uh, use them, we deploy them, and we interpret the data uh, that these uh, instruments uh, collect. And then there's some pictures down below of the professors that are in the department. So, um, you know, where is Amherst? Uh, I just like to throw this up here, and I guess uh, there's a little 
picture of a famous uh, former resident of Amherst. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes who that might be. Uh, that turns out to be Emily Dickinson, a, a famous American poetess who's known for secluding herself in the upper floors of her parents' house uh, when she was young. And so uh, this is where Amherst is. It's in Western Massachusetts, uh, not far. It's about two hour drive from Boston. Uh, there's a little close-up map that you see. Uh, we're not far from the Harvard Forest. It's actually Harvard Forest is owned and operated by Harvard University, which is in Boston, which is on actually the right side of the map. That grayish area uh, is where Boston is. And uh, that what you see between Amherst and the Harvard Forest is what's known as the Quabbin Reservoir. It's actually a, an artificial uh, water reservoir that gives eastern Massachusetts uh, most of its drinking water uh, throughout the year. And so as you can see there, Amherst is not that far from this well-known research forest. And indeed, I've spent time there myself. And it's a, it gives you some appreciation for the kind of resources that are not far from the place that I work and live. So um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, in, 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 at UMass and uh, the Microwave Remote Sensing Laboratory, we design, build, and use microwave systems for studying the environment. Uh, we work uh, everywhere from very low frequency all the way up to uh, hundreds of gigahertz. Uh, most of our systems are between 100 megahertz and 100 gigahertz. And we do things like study severe weather. You can see a tornado and a hurricane in that picture. We've looked at snow. We also have access to a, a small Cessna that flies out of an airport just five miles from campus. And so we uh, can actually create our own synthetic aperture radar images and some of those you see on the right-hand side of this view graph. And so what we, uh, in essence, are doing is working on basic concepts and working our way up to creating remote sensing instruments that might ultimately uh, end up in space on a satellite platform. So uh, in today's interaction, um, uh, this, is, this is sort of a brief outline. So I wanna talk a little something about INSAR uh, versus synthetic aperture radar. Uh, then we'll talk about the use of synthetic aperture radar, or INSAR, I should say there, uh, for forest stand height mapping. And then I'm going to go through a, let's call it a conceptual exercise in estimating forest stand height. And the reason I'm saying this is because I know a number of you have done the, um, the uh, using Google Earth Engine on implementing things from Sentinel-1, and uh, in part because of the complexity associated with the uh, interferometric SAR and working with forest stand height. Uh, this is not so easily implemented on, a, on sort of a, a platform as Google Earth Engine. And so it requires a fair amount of your own computational resources, uh, which could happen on indeed on a desktop or a Linux computer or uh, something of, of similar power and uh, skill to, um, to be able to implement and use these algorithms. And then we'll have some time for question and answers which I think will be ultimately uh, given through the chat window uh, in the uh, GoToMeeting uh, webinar that you are participating right now. And indeed, as we go through this, I'll be trying to pay attention to that uh, during the actual seminar and answer questions if there are some short questions that I might be able to address as uh, you're listening to this uh, uh, lecture. So a lot of the motivation uh, behind what we're doing here uh, has to do with NISAR. You've heard a fair amount about NISAR. That's the NASA ISRO synthetic aperture radar. Uh, this is a picture of what it looks like. Uh, you see there the large uh, 12 meter reflector on the top separated by a boom. And then this is what they call the spacecraft bus. And so what happens is uh, signals are generated on the bus. They reflect off of the boom and then they uh, hit the surface of the earth and they bounce back and get uh, recorded. And so um, uh, I'm part of the NISAR science team. Uh, NISAR is uh, going to be making global uh, observations of most of the Earth's land surfaces two times every 12 days. And the little, little color codes that you see here have to do with the different observing modes. One of the dominant observing modes is the background land mode, which means it's going to be dual polarized. And uh, that'll be collected uh, uh, on ascending and descending passes. And so uh, NISAR has a repeat orbit of 12 days. And so uh, that's two times every 12 days observing basically everything that you see in green here uh, using that dual polarized observing mode, which is of course very useful as you've learned by now for vegetation mapping. So um, 
right? Uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar and microwaves are different than optical data. This is actually a fairly old image, but I like to show this um, because, uh, so first of all, this is an old image. This is from JRS-1 from the 1990s, and it shows a global mosaic at L-band. And you can see there the different streaks. Uh, each of those streaks, which have slight radiometric errors, either due to freeze-thaw effects of the ground or soil moisture variations. Um, uh, but that shows you sort of the, the, the size of the orbit and the, and the swath. In this case, that was a 70-kilometer swath. Uh, by contrast, NISAR will have a 240-kilometer swath. So it's roughly on the order of, of four of those 70-kilometer ones uh, stacked right next to each other. Uh, but the point is, is that you can theoretically uh, get an image like this now with NISAR two times every 12 days. So prior, JRS-1 had a repeat orbit of 44 days. It had some data downlink limitations, so it couldn't uh, generate that much data in that short of a time period. And so it had its fundamental limitations, but you can see the sort of large volume of data that was able to collect uh, irrespective of things like cloud cover and you're going to be seeing something similar on a much more repeatable basis and continuous basis uh, that's going to be delivered by NISAR. So this is a, a little bit of um, the, the fundamentals of NISAR and actually I often talk only about the L-band part of NISAR. Uh, that's because the L-band is going to be the one that has uh, the full global coverage two times every 12 days. Uh, there is also an S-band uh, uh, wavelength, which is a higher frequency, uh, shorter wavelength that'll be collected as well, uh, but not uh, globally, mostly over India, but there'll be some places outside of India. So there'll be an opportunity for doing two frequency observations as well. So this is, uh, I'm on the NISAR science team, and this is the, the NASA part of the NISAR science team. Uh, so I'm the lead of the ecosystems part of the science team. Uh, part of the ecosystem science team also includes uh, uh, Sasan Sachi, Joseph Kellendorfer, Bruce Chapman, Ralph Dubaya. He's also the, Ralph is the PI of, of JEDI, for those of you who know what that is. There's Kyle McDonald and Nathan Torbick. So the, the sort of uh, four or five fundamental science drivers for NISAR ecosystems have to do with biomass estimation, disturbance monitoring, inundation extent, agricultural area mapping, and monitoring of coastal wetlands. And what you see here on the middle graphic is, is sort of like a, a standard growing season, in this case for agriculture. And so if you're observing, and that's what these little uh, blue tick marks are, is to show that uh, uh, NISAR will be passing over targets like this on a regular basis. And you can, in essence, watch a field grow as a function of time because of the dense time series that NISAR will be affording uh, uh, through its observing strategy. And so that can be very useful for all the um, topics that you see there on the left, certainly for agriculture, which is in the middle. And what you see there on the right is a, a flood pulse going through the Amazon River. And this was a, a data actually collected by um, JRS-1 uh, back in the 1990s. And you can see the strong double bound signature that appears there as well. So all these sort of time dependent signatures uh, will be a unique contribution for NISAR and a very interesting aspect that heretofore has been unavailable. And, um, and then, in fact, I would say one of the first areas of availability of this kind of systematic data collections has been through the uh, Sentinel-1 uh, data that's available um, uh, nowadays, especially through Google Earth Engine. Sentinel-1 works at a C-band wavelength. So that's about five centimeters, maybe about the width of your palm. And so um, that's going to resonate most strongly with physical objects that are on that physical, on that same dimensional scale. Whereas at L-band, uh, the wavelength is 24 centimeters, so about the length of your forearm. And so you can imagine the longer wavelength will be uh, much more useful for studying the effects of uh, various vegetation components, whether they have to are associated with agriculture, uh, flooding, uh, and, uh, and the presence of forest and forest biomass or forest structure. So, uh, you know, that's, that was the U.S. side of NISAR. Actually, NISAR is much larger uh, than that. Uh, just the ecosystems aspect alone, uh, we have the, the NASA component, which you see there at the top, and we have our Indian colleagues, and there's probably a few there that I haven't even included. And those Indian colleagues are parts of the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO. 
and uh, down below, uh, John Armston and Erica Podest are also uh, members, I would say, uh, co-investigators that are associated with the uh, MISAR science team as well. So uh, a lot of you might be joining this webinar because you're interested in, in global biomass. Uh, you might be connected to uh, uh, government organizations that need to uh, uh, show making, uh, making progress on, on the development of forest resources, of sequestering carbon in your local resources. And so I am well aware that this is an important aspect of, of, of NISAR and why many of you might be paying attention and wanting to use synthetic aperture radar for monitoring forest resources. So one of the very uh, appealing things about synthetic aperture radar, of course, is this, this dependable data collection strategy. The fact that you can be flying over an area uh, two times every 12 days and with a very high likelihood get an unobstructed image of that area, whether it's day or night, uh, and independent of whatever season it is. So that way, uh, we can uh, uh, you know, do things like observe and monitor things like disturbance or um, uh, you know, uh, agricultural regions for crop security or food security and those different types of applications. So, but biomass certainly is a, is a big one uh, in part because there are global treaties uh, that are, are signed uh, related to this topic. And so there are uh, internal needs in every country for being able to monitor uh, internal resources and to uh, uh, see how that is developing over time. And so NISAR does have a biomass requirement. The, the natural relationship that people use for biomass uh, and radar is to associate the, um, the, the radar cross-section or the radar brightness with the presence of vegetation. So a, a, a darker region will have less vegetation and a brighter region is assumed to have more vegetation. And that's after you sort of account for things like open water bodies and things like cities. Um, uh, uh, but in essence, uh, uh, that's the sort of standard and most reliable way of estimating biomass. Using backscatter and biomass uh, to relate to one another is uh, known to have a, a limitation that's known as the saturation effect and that, that is, at some point, after you, as you add more biomass, the radar cross-section doesn't change, and therefore you are no longer sensitive to the presence of biomass. And so uh, a well-known metric of that is, or, or a, a threshold for when that saturation occurs is on the order of 100 megagrams per hectare. And this is what the, the requirement is for NISAR in terms of monitoring biomass up to 100 tons per hectare, as you see here. Um, but as you saw in the previous view graph, everything that's green in this view graph shows those regions worldwide that are estimated to have biomass less than 100 tons per hectare. So even though it doesn't cover all of the world's biomass, it covers uh, the vast majority of it. And so even though there is this fundamental limitation, uh, it's still a useful uh, aspect of using synthetic aperture radar for monitoring in-country biomass. So another kind of, um, oh, and this is that again. One other thing I might wanna say is, is many people who work with uh, forests are also uh, have explored the use of, uh, of um, using uh, things like the, the, the diameter of trees to estimate the biomass. And uh, if you have access to LIDAR, you can also create empirical equations that relate the height of forest to the amount of biomass in a forest after you control for environmental factors and those sorts of things. So sometimes you don't always have to just look at things like the radar brightness, which is a form of summing up scatterers within a forest canopy. If you can measure things like the height remotely, then you have an alternative means for estimating forest biomass. And indeed, this has a lot to do with the, with the motivation behind the forest stand height algorithm that we'll be going through today. So a little bit more about NISAR, and I've got about another 10 or 15 view graphs just related to some of the background materials. Uh, so NISAR is gonna be collecting things in a track frame uh, coordinate system where things will be consistent as a function of time. That is once it launches, uh, things that you see like in red and green there will be, uh, you'll be able to refer to those as specific tracks and frames and you could collect time series and uh, use that, use those time series in a trivial manner to, 
manner just by stacking the different images on top of each other and looking at pixels as a function of time would give you those sort of time series. So it turns out that there's 173 unique tracks that completely span the equator and that sort of uh, dictates the number of tracks that NISAR will be uh, creating. And this is a, an image of Southern California showing the sort of uh, orientation of the ascending and descending tracks uh, that will be created for NISAR. And uh, if I haven't mentioned it yet, uh, the, the, or you haven't heard that before, the, the fundamental resolution for NISAR is on the order of, uh, of 8 meters by 12 meter pixels. Uh, that's the single look complex uh, uh, resolution, the highest resolution that NISAR can provide. And as you might have learned in previous versions of this uh, seminar series, is uh, you can reduce speckle by uh, averaging that and reducing the resolution a little bit and um, uh, improving the signal noise ratio uh, of your imagery. And so typically, what most data that you might use from NISAR might be on the order of 25 meter pixels or multi look even higher to 100 meter pixels or so. And those 100 meter pixels are the resolution that uh, uh, the NISAR uh, requirements are meant to deliver uh, final products like biomass or crop area. Although the inherent resolution of the sensor and the resolution that you'll have access to as a user will be much higher than that. So just in terms of displaying data, and you guys have uh, might have done things like this, you can look at different polarizations. In this case, a lot of the NISAR background land observations are going to be dual polarized. That means uh, co-polarized horizontal. That means you transmit horizontal, receive horizontal, and also the cross-polarized signature. So you, you're, you're still using the same transmitted signal, the horizontally polarized signal, and then you receive it in vertical polarization. So that gives you two channels to observe, and you can you know, add color to the, uh, those channels, which is just a grayscale image, and create pictures like this. And in this case, things that are blue are typically associated with open water bodies, or sometimes even roads, just the way that that color scheme works out. And then green is normally associated with forests uh, using this color scheme, as you would expect. And then uh, doing that for just one image, and then you can, because the, the uh, synthetic after radar uh, lends itself well to creating time series, you can look at time series of data uh, just as you see here. And uh, what you see on those numbers at the top have to do with the year, month, and the date. And you can see that you can create a time series of these kind of images uh, for observing how things are changing as a function of time. And this is just some little example of some time series analysis you might do. In this case, it's using ALOS 2 observations. There's a calendar at the top, and the different dots have to do with the different polarization combinations for parts on the ground. And so you can look at different land cover classes and look at how they change as a function of time and use those time series patterns to better understand what the seasonality and what the um, land cover type might be in those different areas. And that the first one was for copole, and this one is for cross pole. So I'm going to start delving into some of the concepts that are associated with four stand height, and um, and one of these is going to be interferometry. Uh, before going that, I want to talk about an inherent ambiguity that's associated with synthetic aperture radar. And so imagine that that the thing that you see there on the left that's labeled E1. Think of that as the as the satellite or an aircraft that's transmitting a signal. That signal is represented by that sinusoidal wave. It hits the target, it bounces back, and that basically is what is used to create the synthetic aperture radar image. And uh, when you observe targets on the ground in that way, right, you have this sort of the small ambiguity. You don't quite know exactly where the energy came from. You can point the antenna in a certain direction, but it's not like a laser beam. And, and the way synthetic aperture radar works, it spreads out energy in what we call the elevation direction. And so as we're, we're basically measuring time, and using that time is how you get the resolution in the cross-track direction, and then you can project that onto the surface of the Earth. But what you're still missing is the sort of fine-scale look angle ambiguity. Um, in terms of knowing exactly where the response from the target was coming from. And just a little bit more in terms of background, in terms of uh, a theory. Uh, uh, everybody might have 
heard about the you know Doppler processing with SAR and heard a little bit about what Doppler is. And so, you know, if something is moving towards you, it has a, what you might call a, a blue shifted Doppler signature. And if it's moving away from you, you'd say it was red shifted or going towards a lower frequency. And so synthetic aperture radar makes use of this Doppler shift for creating this unprecedented resolution, which again is something on, on the order of eight to 12 meters, eight meters in one dimension, 12 meters in the other dimension. Uh, and, and, and that, resolution irrespective of distance from the target is ultimately due to this Doppler sharpening that happens through this uh, uh, interpretation of the of the imagery as being Doppler shifted and so this is just a little illustration of how that happens so you can imagine you've got a platform that's moving in the direction of travel that you see in this diagram it's looking off to the side if it's looking exactly off to the side then targets are neither approaching or leaving it at that very instant and so you call that the zero Doppler or the broadside direction. And then if something is forward in the direction of travel, then of course that would have a, a positive Doppler, a blue shifted Doppler, as opposed to negative, uh, if it was behind you and that would be a, a negative Doppler. So each of those, as a target is, as, as, a, as, a, as a platform is passing by a, a target, it, that target starts off with a blue shift, it goes to zero and then it gets red shifted, right? Basically high frequency, uh, zero frequency down to red uh, uh, to low frequency and so that's what they call the Doppler history and each target has a sort of unique Doppler history has a unique range profile and so based on those two independent measures of how a target behaves is what you can do to create a high resolution SAR image and this is just sort of an illustration I'm going to put here that shows uh, you know how uh, as as the platform is moving along this is the the aperture of the, the the real aperture moving along and it illuminates the ground and things that are illuminated by multiple uh, locations uh, as the radar is moving by you can get this sort of high resolution in the along track direction and that's what gives us uh, synthetic aperture radar so now i want to talk a little bit about processing flow uh, for synthetic aperture radar. So um, many of you have heard about SAR processing. You might be familiar with some packages that people either commercially sell or give away for free for working on SAR processing. And so this gives um, some structure to that and also relates to some of the language that's used to refer to that structure. So we'll just go through this slowly and sort of uh, see how we go. But um, so you know, this is showing the, the basic process of taking radar data that was collected on a platform, whether it's a satellite or an aircraft, and then converting it into the imagery that you're familiar with and you've already seen as part of this, uh, this, this seminar series. So uh, what happens is you, you downlink the raw data from the satellite. Uh, that data is formatted into standardized files that contain information about like the time of day that the um, data was collected, where the satellite was, uh, what the name of the satellite was, and some information about all the data that was collected, like the sampling rate of the analog to digital converters and those sorts of things. And so when you look at raw data that comes from the satellite that's packaged into these raw data formats by the space agencies, that's what's called raw data. We call that level one data. And if you wanna convert that data into imagery, you need some some somewhat sophisticated processing uh, algorithms. And so some commercial makers of those processing algorithms are like Gamma Remote Sensing, based in Switzerland, uh, makes a uh, SAR processor. SARscape, also based in Switzerland, offers an IDL version of that. There are some freely available versions. An older one of those uh, free versions is called ROYPAC, although I think that's uh, harder to uh, obtain these days because it's been superseded by uh, this ISCE, or what people call the ICE processor. And uh, unfortunately, I don't remember what ICE stands for at the moment, but anyways, it's listed there. You can Google it and figure those things out. So if you want to uh, convert raw data, which is just simple voltages uh, that are collected by the satellite as it's passing by uh, targets on the ground into what you might call, a, what they do call slant range data or level 1.1 data, it's basically in the same coordinates of, as the radar, uh, then that's what you use those processors for. And then if you want to put those 
radar coordinate data into a domain that we experience, which we, which I call uh, you know uh, the ground range, right? That's what we call uh, you know map level data. Uh, that's what we call level 1.5 data, right? So when you project things that are in the satellite coordinate system into a ground range, uh, that goes from level 1.1 to level 1.5. And so there are some tools for doing that. There's a well-known one that used to be available at the Alaska Satellite Facility called MapReady. There's uh, Pulsar Pro is another one. And, uh, and uh, actually the SNAP toolbox, which is not listed here, also allows for doing that. And then once you have things in ground range, then you can do all kinds of image processing, classification. Um, actually, these are this is a little dated slide. So things like Envy could be used, ArcGIS, QGIS, of course, uh, and, um, and, and the Google Earth Engine uh, could all be used for further interpreting the data and turning them into the, what you call level two or you know, corrected ground range data and, and map coordinates and interpreted using um, classifiers and those sorts of things. Okay, and this is just sort of give you an idea of what SAR data looks like, you know, when it's raw. So everything you see here on the right are, you know, oh, by the way, so as you go vertically on this uh, diagram, that's what they call uh, slow time as the satellite's passing by, it's sending out pulses of, of radar pulses and those travel at the speed of light. And those are recorded uh, using the onboard electronics. And so every time you transmit a pulse, you observe it as a function of time. And that function of time that you're recording that pulse is what happens on the horizontal axis of this image. And so this looks like noise, right? And indeed, that's what raw SAR data looks like. And it requires some knowledge to convert it into normal imagery. And this is what level 1.0 data looks like. So the first thing that you might do is range compression, right? So you want to uh, create images that are, uh, make sense in the range direction. And so uh, this is what it looks like when you do range compression. And in the process of doing that, actually, you are measuring the power that comes back to the radar, right? The, the total, how much, what the reflectivity is. And you're also measuring the amount of time it takes for the, to leave the radar and hit the target and come back. And you can actually measure that amount of time to sub-wavelength scale. So it's a very small amount of time and that gets converted into a uh, phase. Uh, and that's what is a second piece of information that you see there on the right. So this still looks not very useful. Uh, the next thing that you wanna do is the Doppler processing or what they call azimuth compression. And so this is the result of that for this particular scene. So on the left, you see the, the magnitude on the right is the phase. And so this is what you might call the slant range or the level 1.1 data coming out of the synthetic aperture radar. And what you can see there is still the phase looks fairly noisy, basically because targets are, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, small portions of a wavelength away from the from the, the satellite, and so it, that looks like noise in terms of the phase. But what you see there on the left, you can start seeing actual uh, targets there. Uh, for those of you who are used to looking at this kind of data, you might see some straight lines here that are associated with things like farmers' fields. You might see a curving. A meandering line that's probably a river in this image, uh, among other things. But the next step then is to take this radar coordinate data and then project it onto the ground range. And so when you do that, based on just pure geometry and knowing where the satellite is, what direction it was pointing, and you know where it was on the planet, uh, then you can take those power measurements on a per pixel basis, project them onto the surface of the Earth. And lo and behold, you get this image, which looks a lot more like an optical image and puts things into a much, uh, uh, into a domain that we're much more used to, right? The, 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 the ground projected domain, the map domain. This is, of course, the, the world that we live in. And so here you can clearly see where there might be roads, there might be forests, farmers' fields, uh, and all those kind of things in this image. And so this becomes uh, quite useful at this level. So all that discussion had everything to do with what you coming up with what you see on the left hand side of this view graph right here. That's the radar cross section, and this is of a of a volcano in uh, Hawaii. Um, but you probably have heard about using SAR for mapping topography, right? The space the, the space shuttle radar topography mission SRTM flown in uh, year 2001 uh, collected. Um, 
uh, topographic phase uh, on board the space shuttle in 11 day period and created much of the world's um, topography, made a map and, and, and created maps just like the one you see here on the, on, on, in the middle under topographic phase. So uh, by making, and, and well, so that's one of the output products that you can actually use um, by, and we'll be talking about that in just a moment. So that, that's, a, that's a useful output from uh, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, secondly, you can also measure what they call correlation magnitude. So when you take two radar images and you multiply them by each other and you take the, an average and then take the magnitude of that, uh, it creates this thing called a correlation magnitude. And you can see there's information there that's different from the radar cross section. It's different from the topographic phase. And so that's sort of an interesting layer of information of it in of its own right. So those are three fundamental data types. And then there's the fourth one, which we're not really going to be talking about today, but it's just sort of interesting. And this is what would happen if you had an idea of what the topographic phase should be. You had an idea what the topography should be for an area. And then you go and measure it with an interferometer. And then you take the difference of those two topographies. And that's what you see on the right. That's called the differential interferogram. And that can be useful if, for instance, the uh, height or the size of your volcano might be changing by a small amount. Uh, you can actually see this using uh, repeat observations of the same target using uh, interferometric SAR and looking at a time series of these interferograms and looking at how actually the topography is changing. And most people would think, well, the topography is not changing very much at all, which is true typically. Uh, but even if it's changing a small amount, it can show up, as you see on the right-hand side, in the strong uh, signature uh, called the differential interferogram. So I want to talk a, a little bit now more about forest and height and where we're coming from. So this is where we sort of first started talking about this topic. There is, if you have a, a single antenna flying through space, uh, and so that's what, that, think of this as your platform, which is coming into and out of the page there and it's looking off to the right. So that's, if you have one observation, you have this fundamental look angle ambiguity. And so this would not be very good at determining topographic height. If you add a second antenna, and so this was our old one, this E1, and now you've got E2, and now you you can hit the target with a signal using E1, and then you do the exact same thing using a second antenna, E2. Think of that as another, another satellite, another airplane, or another, uh, antenna on the same platform, and so you uh, transmit to the ground, it hits the same target on the ground and comes back. So in essence, this E1 and E2, you're very far away from the target, so those, the, the, the look angle difference between uh, uh, E1 and the target and E2 and the target is very small. In essence, those lines are running in parallel. And so E1 and E2 are going to observe, in essence, the exact same signal as one another, with one exception. And that is, you're going to be measuring what they call this differential phase. And this differential phase, you can determine uh, by comparing the signal E1 and E2 with each other in the complex domain. And then based on that, you can solve for what this look angle is to a much higher degree of accuracy than you had before. If you know that look angle very accurately, you know this difference, the distance between the two antennas very accurately, you know the height of the platform very accurately. Then you can just use some simple trigonometry, which we're not going to talk about at all. And just using simple trigonometry, you can actually solve for what that look angle is from the platform to the target. And so that is ultimately how people use interferometry for estimating or measuring topography. Another way to illustrate that very clearly is right here. So again, you've got two antennas. There's slightly different ranges to the target. Those intersect at different places. And so you can use that uh, in triangulation to figure out what the height of the terrain is based on those observations. And that's all that we're really doing with interferometry. So that might be one take home message right here is I, I'm showing you terrain and you've got two antennas, uh, you're bouncing signals off the surface of the earth and you're using that to estimate to, uh, topography. Okay, that makes sense. But what do we actually mean by topography is a question you might ask yourself. So topography, we normally associate that as the bare ground surface, right? But let's say now you have a forest. Now, is the, is the topography uh, the surface underneath the forest? Is it the top of the forest? 
and in which situations might you want one versus the other and uh, and could you use that bit of information to give you something that you might want to know about the forest okay and so that's exactly the concept that we're talking about here with forest stand height so again uh, there you see on the left is a diagram very similar to the ones that I showed you before you've got two platforms two antennas maybe on the same platform and you're just measuring a path length difference to measure the terrain height but what does that difference what does that terrain height mean when you're looking at a forest which actually has things that are um, uh, have many heights and so and what kind of signature does that give in an interferometer uh, when you're observing uh, a target that has interactions not just at the top of the tree at the bottom of the tree but throughout the volume of the forest and so that is what ultimately gives rise to this forest stand height signature uh, uh, that we'd like to use um, uh, uh, using SAR interferometry. So uh, let's have a look at what, you know, how do you make SAR interferograms? And so what you see there on the left, uh, this is a, a place actually in Colombia. And, um, and so what we're doing is we're taking two radar scenes uh, to create one image consisting of complex numbers, this magnitude and phase that I talked about. So on the left here, you might see scene one that might be collected on one day. And these are scenes actually that were collected by uh, ALOS-1 uh, back in 2010. And these data were collected about one and a half months apart. So on the left, you see uh, one of those scenes. You see the other one uh, called scene two, uh, collected a month and a half later. And those scenes look nearly identical. And so uh, you could compare those with one another both in terms of the magnitude and phase. And then you can create that, that topographic phase signature that I showed you a few view graphs back. And that's what you see there on the far right. It's called the correlation phase. And you can associate that with topography. In this case, this area is on a, on a slope, right? The, the, this, this, this part of Columbia is on a slope. And actually what you might also be noticing here is there might be some slight what you might call a, a phase trend in the data, which can ultimately be removed by the processing software. Uh, something else you might notice is um, in, the, in, in, in the backscatter data are these bright grayish areas. Those are associated with forests. The, the darker regions are non-forest areas. And then the very dark is, of course, uh, uh, water bodies, or in this case, it's, it's a river going through that area. So, um, so that's so that's the, the the backscatter power you see in scene one and two, the correlation phase that you see on the far right, and then this middle one that I'm calling the correlation magnitude, or what people also call the interferometric coherence, is the consistency of the data from one observation to the next. So these two data were collected a month and a half apart, and what you see there is these very bright regions, those seem to be associated with these bare surfaces right here. Okay, that's interesting. So those bare surfaces show a lot of consistency from one period to the next. In other words, that bare surface hasn't changed during that month and a half period between those observations. And that makes sense, right? People aren't out there disturbing those surfaces. And so those have a high coherence or a high correlation magnitude. Notice this water body that you see here in the um, in the middle of those bare surfaces, and it shows up as a dark area in that uh, correlation magnitude image, and so that's showing you that there isn't much consistency in that water body. And then that's true because the surface of the water is continually changing, so it appears darker compared to the bare surfaces that are surrounding it. And you could say something similar about the river, right? That also you can barely see in the correlation magnitude, but it appears dark because that surface is continually changing. Now, what's particularly interesting about this particular image is notice where that there are forests, right? Everywhere that's in essence gray here is associated with a forest and those appear dark. And so what's happening then is between these two observations, even though the brightness of the forest is not changing from between scene one and scene two, those trees are moving, right? Either there's some weather that's blown through and that's caused the forest to, to, to blow around a little bit, Right, imagine it's like taking a, a photograph of somebody and they keep moving when you're taking the photograph and the image looks a little bit blurry, right? You can still see that the person's there, but the, the, the output result is that they're blurred a little bit. So these darker areas are in essence 
an indication that something there is moving on the ground and therefore the correlation is going down. Well, that's interesting, right? So many of you want to use synthetic after radar for forest mapping. And so one thing you could do indeed is just do a simple threshold classification based on those two scenes that you see there on the left. Or you could do uh, create an interferogram, create that correlation magnitude that you see there uh, uh, in that, uh, on the right and use that as an indicator of where there are forests. And uh, one thing I might wanna add here briefly is not just doing a threshold classification, you might expect, and it turns out that this is true, that if you have some short vegetation and it's moving, it's going to be more consistent between that month and a half period than something that was taller or a very tall tree, right? So something that's taller is gonna move more than something that's shorter. And so you can use that relationship of height to motion to this darker color and the correlation magnitude to make a linkage between this interferometric correlation magnitude and the forest height. And in that sense, that's exactly what the forest stand height algorithm is doing, is explo exploiting that relationship between the physical motion of objects on the ground and associating that with forest height. So now I wanna talk a little bit about um, interferometric processing and how you go about doing that. So uh, anytime you're doing an interferogram, requires two images, like you see there on the left, and then you can create these two images on the right through interferometric processing. Okay, this is what the interferometric processing chain looks like. So first of all, you get the satellite data, you get the satellite orbit data, and then you designate one to be the master, which basically means that it's unchanged. You assume that it's correctly projected onto the ground, et cetera, and the other one's called the slate. And so you want to co-register those two images as closely together as possible to make the interferogram. And this just shows the process of doing that. Okay, I'm not gonna go into this particular detail, but you can see there's a number of steps here that include focusing of the data, um, uh, refining the positioning of the data before you ultimately make a, what they call a multi-looked image, which is what this RMLI is uh, down there below. And so based on all of this, there's really quite a host of interesting information that you can pull out of synthetic aperture radar data. So on the left is just is one area. It's an optical image. Actually, I believe this is in Western Massachusetts. On the right shows you the, the variety of different data sets you can get out of synthetic aperture radar, different polarizations. If you have things like a digital elevation model, right, you know what the topography is, maybe independently measured, not using synthetic aperture radar. You can use that to um, uh, make an interferogram. You can simulate an interferogram. You can co-register those to each other. And then you can look, you can create things like these differential interferograms that you see on the far right there. You can also look at, um, uh, oh, I guess there's just other things here, uh, just showing different possible output products that you can create using uh, synthetic after radar data for your region. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk about the thing that we're really here for today, which is how do you calculate forest stand height from synthetic aperture radar? So the focus is on using L-band as opposed to C-band, which is shorter wavelength. So L-band is 24 centimeters. Remember, it's about the length of your forearm. And we use that because it's a relatively low frequency and it's sensitive to the more permanent woody structures of the forest. So things that are going to move a little bit, but not too much to basically cause a full loss of information. So that works better at L-band as opposed to C-band. And so what we'd like to do is we're interested in things like biomass, right? Or where there's forest. And so there's things that we can do to measure vertical structure, right? We can think of vertical structure as a signature of the presence of vegetation and forests. And so we'd like to actually use this for the NISAR mission or looking backwards at old ALOS missions. And we'd like to use this for investigating forests. So one way we can do that is through backscatter, right? We can look at the power and relate that to biomass. And uh, people have done that and still do that. And it's a very useful measure all by itself. Or if we could measure height, like I just talked about, like LIDAR, then that's a possibility too, 
right? And one way to measure height is to fly two satellites in formation, right? Let's just say we didn't look at the motion of trees at all. We we're just measuring height straight up. And so you can do that. And, um, uh, but that typically requires two satellites and satellites are very expensive, right? Uh, NISAR alone costs actually uh, almost a billion dollars. And so I always think of this as the $500 million question. So do you wanna fly two satellites at the same time? Or do you wanna fly one satellite and then use this temporal decorrelation signature to estimate the height of the forest? And so this is an attempt to address the second version of that, which is use this motion of the forest to estimate the height. So uh, we've actually done this and we've, I'm gonna show you some results of this, uh, of this development and things that you can actually download and do for yourself today. So one of the places we first developed this algorithm was not far from where I am. This is in the US state of Maine. There's another research forest up there called the Howland Forest. And uh, what you see there in the bright red is the physical size of an ALOS-1 image. It's about 70 kilometers wide and uh, 100 kilometers in length. And, um, and the pin that you see there is the location of the Howland Forest. And in that vertical strip, that bluish strip that goes through there, that's actually LIDAR data. So uh, there's a instrument called ELVIS uh, that collected LIDAR forest heights for that same region, and that is overlaying on that particular ALOS image. So of course, LIDAR is typically thought of as the, the gold standard for measuring forest height. So if we have LIDAR data, then we have basically measured the forest height for when that data was collected. Uh, the difficulty, of course, with LIDAR data is it's expensive to collect. Uh, it's really a point measurement. It's not a mapping instrument like a synthetic aperture radar. And so it's one of the reasons that we're using synthetic aperture radar to create maps of forest height rather than doing these point samples. So we're going to explore that right here. And so actually this is a little bit more complicated than I'm going to explain right now, but this is showing you the overall process of how forest stand height is estimated. Uh, there are some algorithms that are posted online that you can download that in essence execute this flow diagram that you see right here. And one way to think of it is this flow diagram is meant here for your future reference. So should you start doing this on your own and have some questions about how this is implemented, you could remember this little discussion that we're having and look at this flow diagram and get some general idea of what's going on. In essence, what happens is you, you start with two synthetic aperture radar images there on the left, you form an interferogram, you do some processing, you combine it with some ground validation forest height, either measured by hand or measured with uh, airborne or terrestrial LIDAR. You combine that with the interferometric uh, SAR data. And from that, you can estimate the forest height there that you see at the bottom. And I, I mentioned this to you before, what we're really doing is just measuring the motion of the trees. And this is meant to depict what that looks like. Um, let me see if this is something that's worth getting into. Uh, one thing that I might wanna say is that correlation magnitude image that I showed earlier, right? That had to do with the fact that the trees were moving. And you can imagine in some parts of the world, trees might be moving more at certain times of the year than others, right? Think of the monsoon season or think about the difference between winter and summer and how much the trees are changing that amount of time. So more change means that the scenes are gonna look less like each other between those time periods. And so there's gonna be a variable in there that is gonna be time dependent. And it's gonna to have to do with the kind of weather or climate where that data was collected. So that makes this a little bit challenging because you need to somehow take that into account, right? What kind of nominology is your forest going through when you're trying to do this estimate of forest stand height. So an easy way to do that, of course, is to just use those images that I showed before. You use some sort of ground validation and you create coefficients in your model that are adjustable. And so if you can adjust those coefficients to match the places where you do know the forest height to the, to the, um, to the radar imagery, 
uh, then you can extend those coefficients to the larger scene because that was collected all at the same time period and thereby extend the geographic extent of your forest height estimates. So with that said, what this plot is showing you is different pairs of interferograms. That's what these dates are right here. This is July, this is 2007, July and August, 2007. The vertical is the average correlation magnitude for an image. So low correlation at, uh, magnitude means not so much information, less useful. Higher correlation magnitudes means that there is more information in the scene and will be more useful for this forest stand height estimation. So for each interferogram, you can calculate what is the mean correlation magnitude for that scene. And if, if it didn't matter what time of the year you were collecting data, all these correlation magnitudes would be the same. But as you can see that they vary, they vary by different seasons, different dates. And so you basically want to create a variety of interferograms uh, and based on that, calculate what the average correlation magnitude is and choose the one with the highest correlation magnitude. Basically the scenes that have remained most consistent between those observing periods. In this case, the scenes that were most consistent was in 2007 between July 10th and August 25th. And another one, which wasn't too bad, was um, uh, July 10th and October 10th. And another one was, uh, uh, was 2010, April 17th and October 18th. So you can use that to indicate which ones you want to use for your forest and height estimation based on those interferometric pairs. So let, let me show you some actual results of this process. So what you see there on the left is that Howland Forest region, it's just a close up. And uh, what you see there uh, on the second from the left, Elvis, right? That's the LIDAR data for the same region. And it's showing you the bright areas, the, the yellow, is on the order of uh, uh, 30 meter tall trees. If something was red, it's 45 meters. You don't see red here because there are no 45 meter tall trees in this area. So this is sort of a, a simple way to, uh, and sort of the sh showing you what the heights of the trees are in this particular region. Okay, so then you can take that and leave that aside for right now. And then you can compute the interferometric SAR correlation magnitude like I had shown you in a previous view graph and plot that at the same time. And so the first thing you might notice when comparing the Elvis image with the INSAR correlation magnitude is that actually they look pretty similar. The one thing that makes it different is in these yellowish regions right along the river, right? And that is places where the river is changing a lot or you might say moving a lot. And the fact that the river is moving a lot might without better knowledge might actually make it look like a tall tree, right? Because the trees are moving and we're associating the movement of trees with, with height. And so if the water is moving, you might mistakenly say that that is the height of a tree as well. But there are other ways to know where there's water and where there isn't. And so you can mask that out. And that's what's done here on the right-hand side. So we've just created a water mask. We've combined it with the radar data and now you can compare the far right image with the Elvis data and you can see a very good correlation between those two independently collected data sets. One from a LIDAR and the other one from repeat pass interferometric SAR. So there's obviously a signature here and we'd like to make best use of that to not just look at one area where we already know the tree heights, right? Can we extend this over the larger area in this particular region? and estimate tree heights in that larger area. And um, I think I'm not gonna talk about this right now. Well, actually, so yeah, on the left again is that same Elvis image. And I was mistaken that the dark red is actually 35 meters. You can compare something like that with the radar cross section, which is this grayscale image. There's not much of a relationship between tree height and radar cross section there. Another one is to look at the interferometric phase <clears throat> or the topographic height. And again, you don't see much of a relationship between the Elvis data and the inter interferometric topographic height. So that doesn't seem so useful. And then this last one is the one I just showed you on the previous view graph. Indeed, there seems to be a visual relationship between those two. And so that's the one we'd like to explore. And if you actually make a measure of, of these different mechanisms for estimating height, and look at what is the root mean squared error between the gold standard, which we'll call the Elvis height, and the estimated height using these different methods. You come up with a plot like this, 
And, um, and so the one that has the least errors for the tallest trees is a solid line. Indeed, that's the NSAR correlation magnitude height. Okay. And so these other ones have more errors. Actually, one notable exception is notice that the SAR backscattering intensity, the radar cross section, actually does a pretty good job of estimating height for very low height trees. And so actually that's something that, that we're exploring now in terms of using augmenting this uh, NSAR correlation magnitude for estimating forest height. But the take home message with this really is to notice that on the, on the horizontal axis, that's the, what we call the ground validation from Elvis at the LIDAR height. The vertical axis is the error. And so minimizing your error is what's desired. And you can see the one with the minimum error in this group here is from the NSAR correlation magnitude, uh, the one that we're talking about today. And so, uh, you know, you can do this for ALOS-1 uh, images. You can do this for making a, a mosaic of images. It turns out that the, the accuracy improves as you increase the number of scenes that are added to the data. And uh, we all know that um, uh, ALOS-1, that, that flew back in the, in, the, in the 2000s. More recently, ALOS-2 has been flying and ALOS-4 will be up and coming. ALOS-2 is advantageous compared to ALOS-1 because instead of having a 46-day repeat period, ALOS-2 had a 14-day repeat period. And you can see across all of these images, you get a consistent behavior in terms of using this NSAR correlation magnitude for estimating forest height. Okay, so let's just um, uh, look at some of these results. And actually this is um, uh, showing you what the advantage is of mosaicing the images. And so what you see there on the left is if you just take the correlation magnitude, uh, you create a mosaic of it and you make a very simple relationship between the correlation magnitude and height, and you get that sort of noisy signal there on the left. Now, if you force the overlap regions to be consistent with one another, uh, then you get a much more consistent looking map. You can correct for the seasonal and the daily effects of weather and the climate. And so you get a much more consistent map of this forest height. And that's what you see there on the right. And this is just showing you that if you wanna map like an entire state, right? You're not just dealing with one set of scenes. You need a bunch of scenes from the synthetic aperture radar. And, uh, and so this is showing you the different orbits and frames that were used uh, to create the main mosaic that I showed you in the previous view graph. And this is a, a description of a paper, which I won't get into, but just showing you how not just making a, a, a height estimate for one scene, which is this, what you see in red right here on the right-hand side, is now that if you only have LIDAR data for one area, or you can propagate knowledge gained from that single LIDAR observation to other scenes where you don't have LIDAR data by using these overlap regions and propagating the information from that place where you do have the information to places where you don't and thereby improving the overall estimate of forest and height for the larger region. And so this shows you the results of something like that when you take two scenes, right? So this is that same area here in central Maine. You might recognize that little lake there on the, on the left-hand side. Here is our ALO scene where we've actually measured the forest stand height using the LIDAR data. There it is again in this figure C. And then you can overlap it with another scene looking at the correlation. And you can see that they're quite different estimates from one another. But now using this overlap region to enforce consistency between the two images, you can create this mosaic, which is much more self-consistent and a way of propagating this information to the larger area. And so you can do this across the whole state of Maine, and that's what you see right there. And I showed in a previous view graph and just uh, showing different methods of dealing with that. And I won't get into that right now. And you'll excuse me, I'm gonna zip through some of these slides here because I think they're not important, but this is a, a, an example of what the state of Maine looks like now, fully calibrated and estimating the forest stand height. One thing that you might notice in this particular image though, is notice here in the upper right-hand corner of our mosaic that we have unusually large trees on the order of 40 meters or more. And actually for this particular part of the world, those are not realistic, right? So those are what you might call an error in the algorithm. 
And that's due to the fact that actually there's a agricultural production area or region in this mosaic. And that's uh, in, near the uh, uh, Canadian province of New Brunswick. And it's causing a lot of decorrelation in the image. That amount of decorrelation is getting interpreted as tall trees, unrealistically tall trees. And so that creates this sort of high estimate. So one thing you could do to correct for that is to include uh, a mask in your data analysis for removing areas that are known agricultural regions so you don't make these unusually high estimates. Another approach would also be to leave those numbers in and then when you find forest heights that are unusually high, let's say 40 meters and above, then you can mask those out post-processing, right? Basically say anything that had a tree height that was above some certain number that was realistic for your region, just call those non-forest and then eliminate them from your larger estimate. And we can compare this to other sort of statewide estimates of forest height. Uh, one of them is uh, a, a well-known measure that was uh, created by Joseph Kellendorfer from Woods Hole. And uh, this is uh, called the NBCD data set. I don't remember what that acronym stands for, but it used SRTM differential heights for estimating forest height. And so there on the left, you see the one from ALOS and the one on the right is from NBCD. And you can see a fairly good correlation. The one thing you might say is the NBCD seems to saturate about a certain height. And in fact, that's a, a known problem with the NBCD data set. And the other thing you might notice is this area that I showed you, the agricultural region for NBCD shows that it's low, correctly low, and it's high for the ALOS. And that has to do with this agricultural development, which could be masked out in a number of ways. And then this just shows the comparison between those different uh, data sets. And I'm gonna skip through these. This is just showing you the sort of fundamental relationship. Showing you, I mean, not any measure is perfect, but there is a direct linear relationship between this uh, INSAR inverted height and what you might call the gold standard, which is the LIDAR RH100 heights. And also I, I mentioned this, you know, you can, you can take these data and propagate them outside of places where we have LIDAR data. And we've actually already done that for the state of Maine and we've even gone to other states and propagated it there and we're able to compare those heights that were derived using that data that was collected, that Elvis data was collected in Maine and compare it with LIDAR data that was collected in the state of Vermont and see how well we did. And this is just showing you there on the left. Actually, this is in New Hampshire, not Vermont. These are just images. This is the LIDAR RH100. And if you compare that to the ALOS data when we mosaiced it, right, this is what you see there on the third one. And again, it looks quite similar to where we have the LIDAR data, which is very encouraging, right? What that's basically showing you is that this ALOS1 data, even without collecting any LIDAR data there at all, looks a lot like where we, uh, that same area where we did collect the LIDAR data. And so we seem to be reliably collecting or making estimates of this forest stand height using this method. So you can do that in an image basis, like you see right here. You could do it at a county level. Many uh, times uh, from a forest resources point of view, you need to make county level assessments on how the forest is changing. And you can compare this against like the US Forest Service estimates, the FIA of what the average forest height is. And that's what you see there on the left. Compare that with the ALOS-1 mosaic that was derived here. And you can see very good agreement between those two different data sets. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit more about how you could do this yourself and what are the resources that are available for you to do this for yourself. And I know that when I'm talking here, it's important to take a break at some point, you know, uh, think a little bit about where you're going and what we've talked about so far. And so we can use this as a moment just to do that. So think about how we started this discussion. We talked about, you know, the forest stand height estimation method and how it fits in with everything that you've learned so far. And so this requires some knowledge and ability to work with interferometrics are. And so we spent some time doing that. And, um, and we talked about how interferometrics are can create imagery that would be useful 
for you, and that would be proportional to characteristics of the forest that you might be interested in. And so here we are now at the point where maybe you're interested in what we're doing and want to see how you could implement this for yourself, and then this is a, an approach to addressing that topic. And so the algorithm uh, that we've talked about has already you know, has been published. You can see the references there on the bottom. These have these data are also um, available on GitHub, and it has its own little wiki that you can access. And so there is the uh, address for the GitHub access for the forest sand height algorithm. It's written in Python, and you can and there are instructions there on how to run it. And it basically is following this little flow diagram that you see there on the right. And what you might recognize there in the picture, indeed, is that three scene mosaic uh, that I just showed you. And indeed, there is a, an example as part of this wiki and GitHub account uh, that you can run through to create that very same set of mosaic images of forest and height uh, yourself uh, to try out this algorithm. And uh, something else I might want to say, though, is, of course, not everybody is interested just in these three scenes in um, central Maine, right? And I, and I was, you know, something else that you should also be able to do and, you know, when it comes time for you to explore on your own is learn how to get data. And so um, knowing how to find data, in this case, we're using the ASF Vertex uh, website, doing a, you know, the search portal, there's the address there on the right, how to get there. You know, if you look at all possible, in this case, these are ALOS 1 scenes. These are freely available. You can download these today. Uh, this is, you know, methods of identifying those scenes. Uh, the best ones that work for this algorithm are what they call fine beam dual poll. And so uh, these ALOS 1 data, which are freely available, were there from 2006 through 2011. And that's a good proxy for working with if you want, have access to ALOS 2 data, which is harder to get. And then the upcoming NISAR data, uh, NISAR will be planned for launch in 2022. So this is a good data set for practicing these algorithms. Even though you're backcasting by a decade or more at this point, um, it's a good way to practice this so that way when uh, up-to-date information uh, becomes available uh, that you'll be able to make use of it in the future. Or also, of course, forests aren't changing that quickly everywhere, and so you can also look at, use it to uh, estimate uh, what the forests were like uh, when these data were collected. And so this is just sort of subsetting that data, looking at one particular scene that I'm going to show here in just a second here. Again, you can create interferograms. You can estimate the, uh, the average correlation magnitude of that interferogram. This is for this area in Columbia. And you can compare that to the, the correlation with ISAT, right? That's a LIDAR uh, that flew at the time that this data was collected. And again, you can see for regions where even this algorithm wasn't developed, you get a pretty good agreement between forest height and this correlation magnitude that's available through the method that we're talking about here. And just to show a close up of that interferogram that you see there on the left, there's that close up in this colorful diagram on the bottom. And op, you know, visually, you can compare it to the optical image. Indeed, you can see dark green regions and light green regions. And basically, that's an indicator of where there's forest and non-forest, and those correlate with each other uh, very well in this particular image. Oh, and then just briefly, I'm going to talk more about uh, actually implementing these things in just a second. But I, you know, uh, so NISAR is coming up, and then uh, JEDI is actually already flying on a space station. So there is LIDAR data that you can use for training the uh, the uh, uh, radar data, either looking backwards using ALOS-1 or ALOS-2, and then looking forwards using NISAR. So there's a, a lot of potential here for doing forest and height estimates on a global basis using these kind of instruments. And the idea here is that you'd have these sort of sampling instruments of LIDAR. That's what these yellow lines are meant to show, kind of like these chicken scratches across the surface of the Earth. And then you have the, the mapped images from synthetic aperture radar, and you could use the LIDAR to inform the radar to fill in the areas between the LIDAR tracks, and that's what this image is showing. Okay, um, you can see I'm running a little short on time, but I'll try to keep this going. Um, 
So uh, you can find data. This is some view graphs that just show how to go about finding data and identifying it. This now is going back to the main, uh, what kind of data that you want. You want level 1.0, that's the raw unprocessed data because you're going to be using something like ICE for processing it. You can identify a region in Maine, uh, get all the images there. In this case, we found, uh, I think it's 10 images. Uh, there they are. And so then those can be cross-correlated with one another to create these interferograms that you can use for forest and height estimation. So um, in order to uh, create those Interferograms, you need to use this ICE software or ROYPAC. We recommend using ICE. And one of the outputs of that, if you learn how to use ICE, is called this topophase.core.geo. So topophase just means it's interferometric. It's an interferogram. Dot core, that's the correlation magnitude. And geo means that it's projected onto the ground or in geographic coordinates. So the first thing that you would need to do if you want to follow this route, uh, processing your own data, your own synthetic after radar data and interferograms is to get a hold of this free copy of the ICE software. It has its own GitHub site. You can see the link there in the view graph. And there's additional materials on ICE that can be found below. And this is not meant to be a tutorial on using MSAR and ICE, but those materials are also available to you. So um, one thing that you do need to know though when you're working with ICE is how to tell it to process your specific data. And there's instructions there for doing that. I've included this also in this view graph so that way you could see what I did. It just basically means editing a very simple text file. My edits there are shown in blue. And then once you have edited that text file, you just type in the simple command there at the bottom in Python, strip map app.py, that's the command, strip map app.xml, that's the text file and you type that in and you wait about an hour and it'll create that interferogram for you uh, that you can play with and look at. And so this creates a number of different images that you can you know, inspect. You know, there on the left is um, an image of the radar cross section. The one in the middle is the correlation magnitude. And again, you can see things with low correlation magnitude are uh, along the river better where there is forest and places with high correlation magnitude are these greenish areas. And so that's uh, gonna be very useful for estimating forest stand height for this region. And on the right, we're not particularly interested in for this application is the topographic phase, uh, but that's also an output of this process. And one thing I, I wanted to mention here is this, there's this viewing tool that you can use that comes with ICE if you download it to your own computer. It's called MDX. And so this is the command you can use for looking at that data. So now to actually, you know, downloading and using, uh, just trying out the forest and hype for this area in Maine. So you can just follow that GitHub site. You can clone or download the entire site onto your home computer. It's not that much data, not that much information. And so it gives you some scripts. Some of them are in Python 2. Uh, or if you prefer Python 3, it gives you those in a separate directory. So those are basically the same scripts, just updated to work uh, with what version of Python that you have. And then the one that's going to be most useful for you is this test example for the strip map app. And um, that provides the process data. And then all you really have to do is just execute the forest stand height algorithm, and you can create your own estimates of forest stand height, just as you see there on the left-hand side image. So uh, just to show you how to actually do that, this is just the command. And so, um, and this command is given both in this view graph and also on the GitHub site. It's just highlighted in blue there. So you can sort of see uh, it's a lengthy command, but it's easy enough to uh, cut and paste. And then, or you can put this into a file, like a shell file and execute it that way. And so there are some inputs here. This is describing what those inputs are. And I won't go through that here. You can read through that on your own. This shows you, these are just basically simple text files that you see there. Uh, the name of the text file is in blue and what the contents are that's in black. And then what you see here in the square box is me executing that test script. And then the, the algorithm is running through and creating some intermediate outputs that you can watch go by as it's doing the processing. And then it outputs data. You can output data in 
one or all of these. I typically just have it produce output data in all of them. So you can have it produce a KML, a GeoTIFF, JSON, MATLAB, or a GIF file. And so those get put into all the little subdirectories with the correct extensions. Anything with a TIFF on it is basically a GeoTIFF. You can look at the size of the images that it produces, right? These are 4,000 pixel images, and then you can display those images in QGIS. So let's have a quick look at what that is. I've actually, believe it or not, just a few more view graphs to go here to show you guys. But so um, uh, on the left is a QGIS image. So the, the inset there is the Elvis data. So green is associated with height. So uh, darker green is the taller trees. White is basically uh, no trees and blue is water, okay, or, or roads. And so that's the input data. We combine that with a land use map. In this case, it was derived from the National Land Cover data set. Uh, that's what you see in black and white on the right uh, for that same QGIS image that I just uh, overlaid right there. And then we can take the forest stand height image that was derived from those previous set of commands and include that. And that's what this is. And actually, this is a combination of both the Elvis data and the forest stand height estimates uh, derived uh, in this process. And you can barely see it, but anywhere there's blue, that's basically the LIDAR data uh, where that sits. And then everywhere else is the same scale uh, uh, forest stand height estimates from the uh, INSAR correlation magnitude. And so the fact that you can't see a nice dividing line between the Elvis data and the forest stand height is an indicator that this is, you know, making a good estimate for the region, and um, and so that this is something that you you've basically extended uh, this lidar data to a 70 kilometer by 100 kilometer region, which is quite useful. And one thing I didn't really mention uh, about the lidar data for that Elvis for that in that previous view graph, right? This this Elvis data that's shown here that took about eight hours uh, on a small platform. Uh, airplane to collect that amount of data. And it takes a lot, takes quite a bit longer to even process that data and uh, actual heights. And so it's a fairly expensive, small scale process to do something like that. Whereas the this scene from ALOS, this is collected in about um, 15 seconds of satellite time. So there's quite a large, um, uh, right, uh, what do you call it, um, a benefit uh, to using the um, the satellite uh, because of its ability to collect data over very large areas very quickly and the consistency of SAR data uh, lends itself well to this kind of process. So you can read more about uh, this through uh, th these papers that are listed here. Um, I've, there's, uh, I can try to make these available on a, a Google Drive should anybody uh, have trouble accessing these particular papers. But these are ways you could read about it and learn more about some of the background of what I talked about. In addition to that, um, this process is, dis is discussed as part of the uh, SAR handbook that was put together by the um, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And this is available online. Uh, there's the, the link for doing that. And so uh, accessing this handbook is free and it's been downloaded quite a number of times uh, globally and you, you are welcome to do so if you, if you haven't done so already. And it has more than just the forest and height algorithm discussed in it. It talks about uh, mangrove mapping, biomass mapping uh, uh, and, and other things and disturbance mapping. And um, just as a little side note, uh, uh, People like visual ways of learning. And so actually Marshall has also made some nice videos about how synthetic aperture radar works. Should you be interested, you can Google those and download them as well. Oh, and then one other thing, which is just a little funny aside, uh, just a few months ago when it was still possible and was still common to fly in airplanes, I was flying to the uh, Tokyo uh, for a meeting uh, as part of the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, uh, ALOS um, meeting that they have on a yearly basis. And uh, sitting as part of the online entertainment, they actually had uh, something about ALOS, the instrument itself. And this is something you could watch while you were on, on the airplane. And I just thought, well, you've really made it when you found yourself as part of the online entertainment on an airplane. So the fact that people are talking about SAR now 
and being able to watch this kind of thing on an airplane on an intercontinental flight is uh, really says something about the, um, the maturity of the technology. So in summary, we've talked about different levels of SAR data usage. We've talked about for stand height, how it requires an inframetric SAR, which can be challenging. It might be a way forward if you are interested in developing your skills in this area in the future. That works best with L-band cross-pull data uh, with small spatial baselines. Uh, the part I'd emphasize here, though, is the L-band and the cross-pull, especially the L-band. It works best with longer wavelengths as opposed to shorter wavelengths that you associate with Sentinel-1. And the data can be found at NASA's Alaska Satellite Facilities DAC. You can download that data and process it yourself. I showed results for the UMass, uh, for the U.S. state of Maine. And then we have height estimation errors, uh, RMSE of less than four meters over resolutions on the order of 250 meters. We can create very large scale mosaics using this, using just a small bit of LIDAR training data. So um, we can improve these things and the tools are part of the uh, GitHub for doing mosaicing, for making use of small repeat cycles and using uh, large amounts of LIDAR samples uh, to help inform the uh, algorithm for doing the mapping of forest stand height. So when you're working with this, it's important though to be aware of the weather effects and uh, climate effects on the interferometric decorrelation signature. So when you create an interferogram, you should use a critical eye to look at it to see if there's even information there that looks like you might be able to make use of it for estimating forest stand height. And once you assess that, then you apply the forest stand height algorithm uh, to make those estimates as I've shown you here. So uh, the ICE 2 and FSH software along with the FSH demo data can be downloaded uh, from GitHub today and you've seen the locations for doing that. And we also went through a demo for how to process data into estimates of forest stand height. So uh, if, as I've mentioned before, please enter any questions you have in the chat box. We'll try to answer those as best as we can. And uh, in, in summary, I'd like to say, Obrigado e felicidades a vocês. Uh, and until we meet again, uh, I want to thank you for paying attention. And best wishes. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our series. We are now moving over to the question and answer session. Um, and I will allow our guest speaker um, Paul Cicada to answer some of these. Uh, before we get into the question and answer session, uh, a few items to note. <clears throat> we do have a homework that is now available on the course website, and um, you can click on that link and complete the homework via Google Forms. Um, in order to receive a certificate of completion, um, you need to complete the homework by um, in two weeks by June 4th um, and have, have uh, attended all of our four uh, webinar series. Um, and again, I just wanna thank you all for being here. We will get through as many questions as we can um, until the end of the session. Um, if you do not uh, get your question answered, you can also email myself, Amber McCollum, or my colleagues, Erica Podest and Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses listed on the presentation. Again, you can also acquire all of the presentation materials and watch past recordings via the course website. So now I will um, hand it over to our guest speaker to um, go through some of these questions. Um, so Paul, if you could just read the question and then read your answer, that would be great. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you, and um, hope everybody enjoyed that last uh, uh, that talk. Um, so yeah, just to go over the um, the question and answers that were asked, and I guess I'll just sort of verbally go through these, and I'll uh, read them off. So, um, and if I'm not sure if somebody wants to add, add feedback to my answers or not, and how that would work, uh, but for now, we'll just do it this way. But so that, uh, you know, given, so the first question is given that the ground surface is continually changing in hilly or mountainous regions, will extracting the tree height in those regions give any kind of an error? 
And so the answer is, well, we haven't really done a full analysis on mountainous terrain yet. However, the algorithm doesn't really depend on terrain or topography for estimating the forest height, is actually using the motion of the trees for estimating the forest height. And so, so much as that's not changing, that is the topography from uh, data collection to data collection, um, it should be more robust to those kind of, uh, 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 that, that kind of an error that we associate with things like LIDAR collections uh, uh, for estimating forest height. So that's question number one. And I'll move on to question number two. So um, can SAR imagery be used to monitor those forest areas which are damaged by insects? Um, so people do use SAR imagery uh, and INSAR for looking at forest damage by insects. Um, so those applications are still experimental. You can look those up. They're sort of research oriented. Uh, that really wasn't the topic of today's uh, discussion, right? We're talking about estimating forest stand height, not really looking at uh, insect disturbance. So then question three, uh, when is NISAR going to be launched? When will the data uh, will the data be freely available? So NISAR will be launched in mid to late 2022. Uh, one of the uncertainties with that date has to do with the effects of, co of the COVID-19 shutdown, which is still ongoing. So I, believe it or not, this is actually uh, disturbed the sort of delivery of physical hardware, which is happening right now. Uh, the S-band data, uh, the S-band radar system is supposed to be delivered to JPL back in April, mid-April. And I don't think that that's happened yet uh, because of the shutdown. So there are some uh, uncertainties now in the launch date, but um, uh, should everything have gone as planned, it would have been mid to late 2022. And I would say still likely before the end of 2022 when it will launch. And yes, the data will be freely available. Um, uh, and so now's a good time to actually learn how to use freely available data. And one way to do that is by exploring the ASF Vertex um, uh, uh, DAC, D-A-A-C. Okay, the fourth question, how is uh, C-band uh, for crop monitoring, especially for, how accurate is C-band for crop monitoring, for especially for Indian subcontent? So, Really, that depends on what you mean by crop monitoring. You know, people want to do yield estimation. Um, uh, is the crop active or not? Uh, uh, crop classification. So Sentinel-1 C-band data can be downloaded now from the uh, ES from ESA and also from the Alaska Satellite Facility. Uh, you can get some images today for the area that you are interested in. Uh, that's so, um, but that's really not the topic of today's talk. But those. Uh, possibilities are there and people certainly look at exactly that using C-band data. So question five, uh, what does modes of acquisition mean? For instance, when you say Sentinel has four modes of acquisition, what does that mean? Does it mean the platform has four types of sensors or is it something else? And um, this is, I'm sort of wrote responses to these questions in real time. So I don't recall saying anything about four modes of acquisition. Uh, maybe I misspoke. Um, or, or didn't hear correctly, uh, either way. Um, NISAR has two basically independent synthetic aperture radars on board. One is at L-band, one is at S-band. S-band is not collected globally. I tend to spend more time talking about L-band for that re reason. All the NASA requirements are based on the L-band data. Uh, uh, and that has to do with the way that NASA operates for requirements checking. Um, so anyways, the, the background, land data at L-band will be mostly dual polarized HH and HV. And so uh, those uh, observing modes uh, could be used for doing algorithm development. Question number six, is it possible to distinguish between deciduous and coniferous forests on radar images? And I'd say not really. I mean, actually, if, if, if you look at the data closely, it does turn out that the radar cross section differs by about a dB or maybe half a dB between those two types of forests. And so, um, but there are many other things that vary at larger scales than that. And so um, it's hard to make an algorithm to sort of definitively tell the difference between those two different forest types. And another way to think of it, of course, is that right, radar is sensitive to mostly structure and in so much as uh, structure is different between deciduous and coniferous forests you might expect to, there would be some detectability there, um, but you that kind of detection really requires uh, multiple modes of observation, 
maybe a combination of optical and radar data. Question seven, please clarify, did you say this technology could determine stem volume or stem area index, or does it require independent data, say from LIDAR to model and calibrate the data? So hopefully this was answered in the later parts of the, the, the talk. Um, but first of all, it doesn't actually determine stem volume uh, directly. It's really just estimating a form of forest height. Um, but you can imagine if you're looking at an index of some sort, like stem area index, uh, that would be related somehow to height or the maturity of a forest, you could create a relationship, like an empirical relationship that would relate the two. Um, uh, regarding independent data, yes, uh, uh, the FSH does require some independent height data from somewhere, just as you saw in the example. It doesn't have to be ubiquitous. It could be in one area and you can propagate the results outward from that one area where you had that uh, data availability. And these days, because of things like uh, JEDI and ISAT 1 and 2 um, and Airborne, LIDAR, uh, there's actually quite a number of resources for getting ancillary LIDAR data that could help inform the FSH algorithm that you heard about today. Okay, question uh, number eight, I think. Um, what is the smallest area of forest disturbance that could be obtained from current SAR data and the future uh, NISAR? Uh, well, so the single look complex, that means the highest resolution available from NISAR is going to be mostly eight meters by 12 meters. Uh, this can depend on whether you're working in radar coordinates or geographic uh, coordinates. Um, and if it's geographic coordinates, you're actually projecting that sort of more uniform sample spacing onto the ground. And so it depends on what the incidence angle is. So it can vary across the swath too. So normally when working in geographic coordinates, the, the, the NISAR mission will actually be delivering uh, 20 meter pixels for 20 megahertz uh, sampling mode of NISAR, which is the standard for most of the background land, except for the continental United States and some other places. Um, uh, at that resolution though, there are about three independent looks per resolution element. And so speckle, depending on your algorithm, speckle could be an issue. Um, but given that, um, you will be able to see disturbance even at that scale. Uh, for the mission requirements, which is sort of what NASA is promising to deliver, and right now it's only they're delivering an algorithm, not sort of global maps, but as being developed and tested at 100 meter resolutions. So there's multiple elements that go into that, right? So all those higher resolution observations from NISAR are, are informing that 100 meter uh, disturbance metric. And you also might wanna think, what is meant by disturbance? So um, in this case for NISAR, disturbance is defined as a 50% change in the vegetation canopy fraction or VCF. And the 50% changes and 50% of its current value, it's 50% of 100%. So if it's 90% VCF today and it's 40% VCF tomorrow, then that is what NISAR would be able, is, is signing up to be able to detect. If it's, um, uh, but that doesn't mean if it's 40% today and 20% tomorrow, then uh, NISAR is not saying that they can reliably determine that number. Uh, given that, that doesn't mean that you couldn't, it's just that, that those are the requirements for NISAR to be successful. Um, there's many algorithms out there uh, that people have uh, either already developed or have yet to develop, and I'm sure there will be uh, useful uh, ways of, of, of combining data or using NISAR data for achieving some of these more um, higher demands on, on the observations. So that, sorry for that being a little bit on the wordy side, but that's sort of my take on the issue. Okay, um, so that's question eight. So we're going on to question nine. So is it not currently feasible to calculate canopy height with Sentinel-1 C-band SAR? Do we need to wait for L-band? So this is a very good question. So C-band SAR has too much temporal decorrelation. It has to do with small motions of leaves would cause uh, large changes in the interferometric phase and cause lots of temporal decorrelation. And temporal decorrelation is how the FSH algorithm works. So you can do standard interferometry with C-band, um, but because the temporal decorrelation over force is higher to estimate the topographic height over force usually doesn't work very well. And so uh, one way you can get around that is to use a tandem set of satellites. So tandem X, which is an X-band, a pair of satellites flown by the German Space Agency or the DLR. Uh, you, you can't 
get good interferograms over forested uh, regions. Um, uh, given that, uh, uh, so so higher frequencies and doing temporal decorrelation doesn't really work well over forests. They tend to create too much decorrelation, and decorrelation ultimately is a measure of loss of information. So that's sort of not as useful at those higher frequencies or shorter wavelengths. At L-band though, there is data available from ALOS-1. You can get that today, just like shown in the demonstration. Uh, some people have access to ALOS-2, so you can get that data as well. And so um, there's been instructions in the uh, discussion on how to get that. So yes, it's historical data, uh, but now is a good time if you're interested in these algorithms to play with them, develop your own, and develop your own workflow. And then when NICER launches, you'll be able to make use of that instrument uh, uh, when that data becomes available. And of course, there are there are uses of backcasting, right? I mean, it, just because it doesn't not everything has to be current. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Um, oh, and by the way, not everything has to be current for forests, right? Because the forests are mostly stable globally, right? I mean, there are certain places where that's changing a lot, but uh, usually we know where those locations are, and just knowing what this, those changes are could be a useful knowledge all by itself. So backcasting can be quite useful. Question 10, is the coherence just the magnitude, just the amplitude of one SLC multiplied with the amplitude of another SLC? So that's, that's a good question. That's close to a, a, a correct question uh, in terms of the supposition by the person asking the question. Um, uh, what I'd have to say, though, is, is actually the, the formula for that can be readily looked up online, by the way, and there's journal papers, including some by myself, that show what that is. But basically, you have to divide by the geometric average of the powers of the two scenes, of the pixel by pixels of the two scenes. Also, if you do a coherence estimate of a single look image, it turns out that that, that average, even when you're dividing by the power, is equal to a value of one, always. It's identically equal to one, and you can do a little bit of math to prove that to yourself. It's the only way to really get a coherence or a correlation magnitude that is useful for this application and other applications like it. You have to do a multi-look averaging. Usually you do four to 25 SLC pixels, and that gives you a more useful measure of coherence. And that coherence is really measuring the consistency uh, between those uh, uh, different uh, uh, pixels. In this case, you'd be measuring the consistency of those pixels uh, as a function of time. And so that's the temporal decorrelation measure that you'd be getting. Okay, so question 11. Can you please clarify what is meant by forest moving? Is that tree growth or something else? So uh, another very good question. No, it is not meant to be the growing of the forest. Uh, that happens over much longer time scales. We're not talking about centimeter kind of changes in the, in the forest height uh, as, as being the, the driver for this algorithm. What is meant is by moving, things like even gentle breezes, winds, changes in the tree water content, you know, whether that happens between, and also uh, things like weather, W-E-A-T-H-E-R, that happens between the observations. So that is, you know, you can go out, go for a walk in the forest today and go out tomorrow, it might look like the same forest. Of course, there's subtle changes that happen, right? The, the leaves have moved a tiny bit. It's enough to cause the interferometric observations to decorrelate by a small amount. That's the, the temporal decorrelation that this algorithm is sensitive to. And so um, uh, I guess that's, that's basically my answer to this question. So uh, question 12, what is the basic difference between LIDAR data and SAR data? Are these, oh, I must have missed this one when I was uh, going through these. Are these NISAR data available for urban areas where there are some wetland and vegetation? What is the regulation on these images? Well, of course, the, the regulation on those images varies by who collected it. If it's NASA data, and I think ESA data, those data are freely available. LIDAR data, uh, depending on who collected it, if it was on an airborne instrument, whoever paid for the airborne instrument would be um, uh, the one who would dictate how it gets used. Uh, these days, you know, there's certainly is ISAT-2 that's flying now. There's ISAT-1. And there's JEDI, G-E-D-I, uh, which is on the, uh, the, the International Space, um, what is that thing called? The International Space Station, ISS. So um, uh, those data are all freely available. And so those are obvious resources to use. And if you have special access to other LIDAR resources, uh, those are certainly 
an option. Okay, so moving right along, uh, question 13. And uh, by the way, um, I, yeah, I can go on as long as it takes to finish these questions. And also, just I'm just reading the chat window here from the organizers. And if I'm talking too quickly or too long, then please just write something there and I'll pay attention. Okay, so um, question 13. Uh, where trees are, are tall with canopy interferometry takes into account multiple heights, which I believe might not. Oops, I'm sorry, I misread that. But, oh, yeah, that's the question. Uh, which I believe might not be available through optical sensors. Therefore, how reliable is the DEM, which is now readily available, derived from optical sensors or narrow range? So DEMs uh, can have uh, uh, variable qualities and also what is meant by DEM can vary uh, um, uh, uh, depending on, well, not, I think there's formal definitions for that, right? There's things like digital terrain model, there's digital elevation model. To be honest, I get confused which one means what, you know, there's the bald earth uh, topography, and then there's the tree canopy, the, the the topography that takes into account tree canopies, and with the difference of those two, of course, being the, the forest height, which is what we're interested in. So some care has to be taken as to what the source of the data is and what was the definition of those things. And, um, but so the, the sort of gold standard though for DEMs, I would say is, is, is nadir looking LIDARs where when you can detect the ground. And so um, that, and of course, uh, doing ground surveys, which can be extremely expensive and uh, and maybe be unreliable depending on the age of the, the the collection and the techniques used. Okay, we'll go on to question fourteen. Okay, so we're going to go on for another twenty minutes or so, and then we'll uh, we'll see how we do here. Let's see, question fourteen: If the time frame is short enough, can you mix L band? and C-band and X-band, since C-band could provide top of canopy, angle dependent, and L-band for the elevation of the ground. I mean, yes, you can certainly, my answer is you can certainly can combine those, um, not through this algorithm so much, right? This algorithm is using tree motion to, to and then a, uh, an empirical relationship to estimate the forest stand height. So what's really being referred to here is like uh, using interferometric SAR and using the different topography is measured at different frequencies for measuring different heights of the forest. And you could do that. Um, and yeah, and, and so, you know, what the penetration depth is for those um, single pass INSAR observations or topographic measures um, uh, could be, would be useful. Um, the one thing that I would like to emphasize here is though you cannot form an interferogram between an L band observation and a C-band observation, for instance. You, you can't cross over frequencies. And it's because of the nature of how phase is defined and how you're doing uh, interferometry. Okay, question 15. Do you have an opinion on PAM tropical forest height product, the accuracy utility produced by Woods Hole for 2007? And are you aware of any similar products or recent updates? So I'm not sure if this is the one that the uh, questioner is referring to by Walker et al. If so, yeah, I think it's reasonable enough. Um, if I remember correctly, it depends on ISAT data. Um, uh, you know, you do have some of these problems with ISAT that it had a 70 meter spot size. So if there's topography within that 70 meters, that would be artificially interpreted as a forest height, unless you had a way to correct for that. So um, JEDI though is a 25 meter spot size, I think. And so um, it's probably a much more useful instrument for that application, especially because JEDI is indeed flying mostly over the, the tropical belt because of the orbit of the International Space Station. How sensitive are NICER, or INSAR uh, estimates of forest height to substantial changes in dielectric properties between time one and two? So substantial is a key word here. You know, I mean, if the, uh, if it's substantial enough to cause a lot of decorrelation, then yeah, I guess I would you call that substantial. You know, and one way to think of that is if it's changes in soil moisture for bare surfaces, then that would uh, that would cause a decorrelation between the observations, and so yes, that could confuse this algorithm. Um, but if it's soil moisture beneath a forest floor, right, the the majority of the radar cross section is coming from the canopy itself, the upper parts of the canopy, not so much from the forest floor. So those kind of changes in the dielectric of the soil moisture, this would be less sensitive to. 
and would be able to withstand uh, some amount of change of soil moisture beneath the, can the forest canopy in, in that situation. Okay, uh, question number 17. Could you please explain why are the two scenes called master and slave? So the master scene is what's assumed geometrically correct, the slave image. So anytime you have uh, different synthetic after radar observations, and even on sometimes the same platform, there's a step of the interferogram processing that is required to co-register the two images to a sub-pixel um, resolution. And there's ways you can do that through a cross-correlation uh, measure and, and, and doing adjustments using a polynomial. And that's actually what's regularly done in interferometric processing. So the master slave is what is assumed to be geometrically perfect, right? So the one that doesn't have to change and the slave image is warped by even sometimes very small amounts to be as co-registered as best as possible to the master image. Okay, we'll go to question 18. Did you use the Elvis L2 elevation and height products to calculate the correlation magnitude or did extra processing from L1B data? So I think what this is referring to are the different output product uh, processing levels for Elvis. Uh, but I think I'm not quite sure because it's been a while since actually I made those that, that example that you saw earlier. Um, but I'm assuming that that's what that means. And so actually I don't really remember, but anything that sort of measures forest height that you have some confidence in, uh, that can, that's, that's what can be used. And, um, and so again, I don't quite remember where that data, how I did that. I, I, used, I basically used MATLAB to process the Elvis data to come up with forest height. Uh, but anyways, um, one thing you might, notice is that sometimes the higher levels of processing mean that more errors have been taken out. And uh, but one thing to note is that this is a right where we're finding a best fit between the temporal decorrelation and the tree height measured by Elvis. So even if there are errors uh, in the Elvis data processing on a pixel to by pixel basis, so long as they're random errors, it shouldn't affect the results of the FSH algorithm uh, as long as you're getting a fundamental relationship between the LIDAR observations and the actual forest height. And then therefore you can create similar relationship between the temporal decorrelation that's used by FSH and the LIDAR data. Okay, let's go on to um, uh, question 19. So the question is about NBCD um, and the difference between ALOS and NBCD. Yeah, the N so somebody noticed that there's some stripes in the ALOS process of data, and those stripes have to do with discontinuities between the observations, the different time periods that were collected. And yet those are, if they, usually if they're rectangular in nature, right, they're associated with the, um, the scene geometry, not what's actually going on on the ground. And so that has to do with, with the, with slight weather variations that happen between the different interferograms that you're trying to mosaic together. And so there will always be some degree of imperfection. And your eye is actually much, much better at picking up imperfections than any computer um, artificial uh, 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 intelligence algorithm could replicate or correct for. And so those tend to be fairly small in magnitude, but they do exist. And for that reason, you may want to look critically at the inputs that you're using for the FSH algorithm. So in other words, if you have, let's say, five synthetic after radar observations from ALOS, you can create interferograms between any pair of those that, from those five. And so you'll have a whole host of interferograms to choose from. And so you're going to want to choose the interferograms that, first of all, have the highest coherence, because that'll give you the most information for estimating FSH. And that's what some of those scatter diagrams that I showed as part of the talk showed. And also, you'll want to choose the interferograms that have the sort of least spatial variation of, uh, in the coherence that might be due to weather. And so sometimes I've noticed when creating interferograms, you'll get these bands of decorrelation that are obviously not due to something that's happening on the ground, but probably due to some weather event that might have been actively occurring when one of the data sets from the SAR were collected. And so even though that might have a good co correlation magnitude across the image, you wouldn't use that because it has that odd weather feature uh, apparent in the data. So you would just choose one of the other pairs uh, 
of, of images for including in your FSH uh, estimate. Okay, question 20. If I want to obtain shrubland, is it possible to obtain it using this method and eliminate forest land using a height threshold? So you could try that, but uh, some care should be taken selecting the data. The reason being that soils of shrublands are exposed and so variations in the soil moisture could create temporal decorrelation and that could appear as variations in the forest height. So uh, what should be done in those cases that you should select scenes that are collected uh, preferably during the dry season. And although I don't have good ground validation for the region that was shown there for Columbia, uh, you can see there if you compare the optical image with the FSH estimate that was made for that region, there's a pretty good relationship uh, between where you can see clearly where there's forest and where there's shrublands, uh, both optically and within the correlation magnitude. So I'd say yes, uh, I, it hasn't been properly tested to answer the, uh, to give a real clear answer to this question, however. And that could be an area of continued uh, research. Question 21. Uh, trees do not have indeterminate growth, so they do not grow on size forever. Um, uh, so, of course, and uh, however, a forest canopy will increase in elevation every year until some time when the scenes, uh, when the data um, uh, slows and stops it. So, has anyone looked at the annual change in canopy elevation as a way to calibrate the age of a stand? So, yeah, actually, I think that people certainly do do that, and uh, that has a lot to do with land use history and and um, uh, and that's actually a very good way to understand things like biodiversity and uh, what a forest has gone through in its life, lifetime, especially uh, if you look at the geospatial variation. So some areas of forest might have undergone different histories right next to other areas of forest that have gone through a not quite the same history. So that, that can be a very interesting thing to look at um, from an ecological point of view. So um, let me see if I want to say anything else here. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I want to say right now. But that, that's still a very useful thing to look into. Okay, question 22. A strong defoliation event between two dates from INSAR can be a problem when estimating three heights. Um, well, actually, maybe not. And I've, I've this is, comes from you know, I, if, if somebody had asked me before I had created these algorithms and done some of my analyses, I would have said, sure, losing all the leaves in a forest, you would expect it to change the radar, the interferometric decorrelation quite a bit. Although some of what, but what the reason I'm hesitating here and agreeing with the questioner is because some of our best interferograms for estimating FSH were collected. One was, one of the scenes was collected in July and the other one in October. And so October in this in this part of the country where Maine is, is when all the leaves are falling off the tree. And at the very least, they're changing color. So they're clearly going through some strong uh, variation in their uh, physical properties. Yet that's what gave us some of the best estimates of forest stand height. So I think the reason, so I, I, I've let the data dictate to me what makes sense and what doesn't. In other words, how well the FSH algorithm works and how well the, the results are consistent with what we know is happening on the ground. And so um, uh, at any rate, uh, I would guess then based on my experience with this algorithm, my experience with interferometry over forests is that losing all the leaves on the tree actually has less of an effect than you might imagine. And if, if that's true, and I think it's true, uh, the reason could be that um, we're more sensitive to the woody structures, the permanent woody structures than than the um, tenuous leaves that uh, grow and change. Okay, question 23. Um, are current publicly available radar images good enough to monitor vegetation interfering with high tension electric transmission lines? I, so I know that this is sort of a strong need on a global basis. I think that's unlikely. This is probably not the best method for doing that. This is a good way to estimate you know, how tall uh, forests are on sort of a hectare or a multi-hectare, you know, it's four to six hectare level basis. So if you want to see places where you might want to more closely investigate power lines, sure, you could use this method for doing that. Uh, these days, things like drones, I think, are sort of much more viable technology for addressing that problem. 
Okay, question 24, how do these sorts of height estimations work in a very pronounced relief regions? So I think I answered that back in question number one. I'll just sort of leave that alone. And we'll try to be a little quick here so we can keep the time uh, reasonable. So um, for areas that, um, uh, for areas that have no LIDAR data, how can estimate error be reduced? Oh yes, so, um, well, so uh, the question is, so places you don't have LIDAR data, you might be referring to places like um, where you don't have airborne LIDAR data. So if you're in the, I, I don't remember the full extent of JEDI data collections, but these days, because of JEDI, that's G-E-D-I, LIDAR data is available somewhere, basically globally, everywhere. So um, as, at least within some sort of latitudinal band limit. Uh, so the higher latitudes because of the orbit of the International Space Station, that's not true, but uh, the lower latitudes certainly. So that's number one. Uh, number two, if you really are missing LIDAR data, uh, another option is to go out there and by hand measure uh, forest height. So you know, many places, the National Forest Service or like the Forest Survey of India regularly collects uh, forest height over regions distributed nationally. And so that data could be used for informing the algorithm. So you only need a few points and they don't have to be continuous like the LIDAR scene that I showed there. You just need something that sort of is, is uh, uh, overlaps with the, um, with the availability of radar data. And um, uh, let me see if I wanna say something else there. Uh, there was something else I was trying to think of. Uh, but okay, now I, I can't remember right at the moment, but there, there are lots of inputs. Oh yeah, there is there is one other method, which I've played with at times, and I'll mention this here. Because another way to think of it too, though, is um, you can use actually an optical image. And if, so if, if you really are missing LIDAR data, and I, I do like using LIDAR data, I think it's a critical tool in this, but let's just say you really wanna try this out and you absolutely can't get any LIDAR data given the other methods I just mentioned, or you don't have access to the forest, survey forest service surveys within your country so one other thing you could do is take an optical image and try to figure out where there's forests where there's not forests and and i mean consistent forests and so you can actually create your own sort of back of the envelope height map of your local region just by doing a by hand classification and wherever you see forests usually what happens is uh forests tend to mature and, the, and they have all the same height. So you could sort of estimate it that way and create basically a fake forest stand height map uh, uh, to use uh, alongside with the radar data collections for your immediate area, and then use that uh, as input data uh, for expanding your simple hand-drawn algorithm to the large area using the, um, the, the, the interferograms. And basically what it's saying is that you know, like I know where around where I live, if, if there's a forest, I can tell you without even leaving my room how tall the trees are. I'll say that they're 20 meters, or maybe I'll say they're 25 meters, and I'll be accurate to within, you know, four or five meters without ever leaving my house. And so um, you could sort of do the same thing. And yes, it's not, it's not very accurate, but it's, you know, given no other information, it's, it might be accurate enough for your application. Okay, that was a little bit longer of an answer than I was intending. 26, uh, is there a rule of thumb for how incoherent an interferogram can be before it is not useful for an FSH algorithm? This is a great question. So uh, uh, I'll give you a, my quick rule of thumb. I would say things with correlations uh, below 0.4 are not very useful. That doesn't mean that they're entirely unuseful, but that's sort of when you're hitting the lower edge. If you're getting correlation magnitudes of 0.2 and 0.3, I would say that's pretty close to being useless. Given that, I'll give you a, a counter argument, which is something you can always do is you can give up resolution for improving uh, uh, the, the, the co correlation magnitude or the accuracy. So, um, so if, 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 you know, um, uh, the, I say, I'm not sure how to explain that further than that. Except that that so if you really are stuck with low correlation, another option is to reduce the resolution. I think your correlation magnitude average would grow go up in that situation, and so you could still do something, but at a lower resolution than was presented today. But the take-home message might be 
point 0.2, point 0.3 is useless, point 0.4 is not desired, point 0.5 and higher is, is better. Okay, can this technique be used on agriculture, shorter planting areas? Would C-band be better for use during this application? So conceptually, yes, the answer it would be, except that um, uh, for agricultural regions, those are actively managed lands, right? So the nice thing about forests is that they're mostly stable. I can go visit one today, I can go out there next week and maybe a month from now, and it's basically the same forest at all times. So that certainly isn't true for agricultural regions. And so for that reason, using temporal decorrelation as an indicator of height um, would not work well. And the height accuracy of what uh, was shown for the forest stand height is already on the order of three to four meters for what was shown. It was shown in one of those plots where I showed the RMSE. Um, so three or four meters, that's enormous from an agricultural point of view. So, um, and even interferometrically, if we're measuring interferometric uh, topography, single pass instruments, uh, you might be have difficulty measuring uh, heights accurately to better than a meter, which is would be important for agricultural regions. Unless you're doing airborne, so that things change when you're airborne because you have more fast temporal revisits. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit further. So question 28. Is it possible to use RSS approaches to estimate forest stand height for linear plantings that have a width of 15 to 25 meters, for example, shelter belt uh, for estimating ground field? I don't know what RSS stands for, root sum squares. I really don't, is that like a mean, is that just curve fitting? Um, uh, I think so. Uh, and viewing geometry is a bit of a headache for satellite SAR, right? Because you're you're always looking in the slant range. And so, it's not really vertical height, it's, it's, this, uh, it's an arc that intersects the forest. So I'm not sure that what was intended by this question, this that would be a good application for what you witnessed today. Question 29, it seems that most analyses use image pairs. Is there a reason not to use multiple image groups, many images and look at variants throughout time? Now you could certainly do that and people do do that. Um, for the very simplistic algorithm here, you're just trying to estimate one number, which is forest stand height. You could imagine, but even that's an error, right? That's not a perfect measure. It's a, it's a rough relationship between the observed temporal decorrelation and the LIDAR measured height. And even the LIDAR measured height is not a perfect measure of tree height, right? Is it the very last leaf on a tree? Is it somewhere in the first meter at the top of the tree? You know, you can come up with questions like that. And, um, and uh, so even this is a loose relationship all by itself. So if you had multiple observations that you trusted for forest and height, rather than looking at how that number changed as a function of time, you might consider averaging those numbers together to improve your accuracy. That would be one option. Another option would be is even though the accuracy of forest and height between um, is, is on the order of three to four meters, at least that was presented today. If you did want to look at time series, you might notice that in some places there are very large changes in the forest stand height. So if somebody's been clear cutting trees and that would show up well uh, using this FSH algorithm. Okay, uh, we'll go do five more minutes of questions here. Uh, let's see, I'll just do question number 30. Are current publicly available radar images good enough to monitor vegetation interfering with high tension transmission lines? So let's just say no. Uh, is it possible to use similar algorithm to measure building height? Uh, not this algorithm, because I, for, for the life of me, I, 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 I hope to lord above that buildings don't get up and walk around. And so, um, so and this is measuring a temporal decorrelation. So. Uh, so not this algorithm per se, but uh, people use interferometry for measuring heights of things all the time. And so since buildings don't move, you can use topographic interferometry. So still repeat pass interferometry, but rather than relying on the magnitude, you would use the phase of the signal and measure the topography directly. And in fact, most applications of interferometry are used exactly for that. Question 32. Could 
you explain the concept of moving force and its relationship to estimating force and height. I think I've already done that. Basically, it's motion, small motion of things, right? And it's causing some form of decorrelation. Uh, and I guess it's an open question to what is that actual motion is, but the, the fundamental concept that FSH is using here is that the taller the tree is, the more motion that you will see. And this is exploiting that. And by the way, one of those papers that is um, cited in the discussion goes into the theoretical uh, uh, addresses the, the theoretical aspects of the question being asked here. And you could look that up. Could you please explain why a mosaic increases the accuracy of forest height estimation, whether the mosaic is made with images taken at different times? This is a great question. So it does, and also does that inf influence the interferogram? So yes, it definitely influences the interferogram. And so each one of the images of force stand height, or let's call it the correlation magnitude, um, is dependent on the temporal decorrelation. And you could imagine from year to year, even if it's the same season, right, the temporal decorrelation collected between passes of the satellite would be different between those. So the relationship between the correlation magnitude and the force stand height will be different because the measures of correlation all by themselves are different because the temporal decorrelation is different. So that, that's potentially a problem. However, by mosaicing images, and if you, if you have one image where you knew what the height was, like from a LIDAR, then you could correct for that empirical connection between the temporal decorrelation and the observed height using that sort of known LIDAR heights, right? That should make sense based on what you've heard today. So now you have an interferometric pair where you don't have LIDAR heights available, but it's adjacent to one scene where you did, or maybe multiple scenes away, right? So what you can do is you can use the intervening scenes between where you had the LIDAR height and where you don't, you can use those overlap regions as let's call it like a form of LIDAR data, right? As if you had, as if that data from the, the scene that had LIDAR was perfectly true everywhere then, and then you could use those overlap regions to inform the scene where you didn't have LIDAR data as if you had LIDAR data for that overlap region and thereby propagate those, co those, those results that you got from the scene where you did have LIDAR data to the outer regions. And so one way to do that is you could literally just propagate it, do, you know, just basically do a, a sequence of corrections as you get closer and closer to the area that you're interested in. And you can do that and that's what was referred to as the wallpapering problem in one of the view graphs, and I really didn't go into that in detail. Um, a better solution would be to make a universal solution so that all scenes agree with each other as best as possible in all the overlap region. And that's what mosaicing is about. And one of the algorithms that's posted on the GitHub website will do that mosaicing and automated estimation for those over, overlap regions for you. Okay, I'll just read the last question. I don't know if I'll have time to answer it. When you say motion of trees, do you mean apparent parallax due to different imaging positions? The short answer is no, it's small motion. So I'm gonna take a break here and we could probably answer these questions offline later, um, unless the moderators wanted to say something. Right, well, great. Thank you very much, Professor Cicada, for uh, all your answers addressing all of these questions. Uh, we are 15 minutes past the hour, so what we will do is we will post this document online with all of the questions answered, even the ones we weren't able to get to today. Okay, so this uh, concludes then this webinar series. And before we close, I, I'd like to thank a couple of people, starting with our guest speaker, Professor Paul Cicada, for the excellent presentation today. And uh, as well as the RSET team, there's a, a very large RSET team that supports the production of these series, uh, starting with Jonathan O'Brien, uh, Selwyn hudson Adoy, Brock Blevins, who's done the heavy lifting here, um, Sean McCartney, Anna Prado, our program manager, David Barbado, he's, uh, he's done all of the translations. Um, I'd like to send a special thanks to uh, Zachary Bengston, Gina Kova, and especially to John Dilger for their support with 
the Google Earth Engine coding. And uh, I'd like to um, also thank the, the, the co-leads here, Amber McCollum and Juan Luis Torres Perez. And of course, to all of you for uh, your interest in SAR and hopefully um, uh, this will lead you to use more SAR data and prepare you for upcoming SAR missions. Um, uh, to you, uh, Amber or Juan, for any closing comments. Great, thank you, Erica. And again, just to reiterate, reiterate my thanks to everyone involved in this training. Um, I also want to mention that we will have a survey that we will send out to you all. Um, and we really appreciate your responses to those surveys. They help us um, see how well this training went, but also provide suggestions and guidance for us as we develop future trainings. And they, they give us a lot of ideas and really allow us to connect with you all, the user community, to see what you want uh, for future trainings. So I just wanted to mention that and, and thank everyone for being with us with this series. Okay, thank you very much, bye-bye. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Wishing you a, um, a great day and uh, a great time exploring SAR. <laughs>